Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. More suggestions for increased security measures when security companies are transporting cash. Manchester woman demands justice, alleging wrongful police shooting. And later in sports, it's a boys and girls champs off and running at the National Stadium. Thank you for joining us. I'm Shamela Pullen. Here are the details. More than 24 hours after the education minister promised that teachers would see their March salaries in their accounts, there are still complaints from teachers to the contrary. In a new press release this morning, the education ministry says public sector teachers have started receiving their March salaries and retroactive amounts. However, speaking with TVJ News a short while ago, JTA President Lasonia Harrison explained that most of her members across the island are still have still not received their March salaries. She's questioning how the impact of the late payment to teachers will be dealt with. It's understood that some teachers who have not yet been paid have opted to stay home. March salary payments were delayed by a number of days as the education ministry worked through the process of accurately converting, approving and uploading the retroactive amounts and new salary rates. There are more suggestions for increased security measures for security companies transporting cash. Security consultant Mark Shields is recommending that security companies use die packs for every unit taking cash to an ATM. We have more in this report. In less than two months, gunmen attacked guards attached to Beryllium Security Company while they were delivering cash. The most recent incident happened on March 19 when they were attacked at a Scotiabank ATM in Brayton Parkway in Portmore. $23 million was reportedly stolen. The first incident took place on February 27 at the JN Bank branch in Portmore Pine, St. Catherine. One guard was killed. The thieves reportedly made off with $10 million, which is why security consultant Mark Shields is recommending that security companies move quickly towards die packs for every unit taken to an ATM. So in the event that a robber decides to try to take on security, then the package will explode cover the robber in red dye or orange dye, there'll be lots of smoke and the money is destroyed. Do that once or twice and it will stop these robberies dead. And I'm really saying that every person who engages a security company should insist in the contract that dye packs are used. They're not expensive, four or five hundred US dollars each, which compared with the life of security guard, I think it's worth every penny. Mr. Shields also suggests that these security guards need to be protected along with citizens. He says the media has a role to play. They're carrying out you know, what at the moment is an extremely difficult and dangerous task and they need to be protected. So anything that can be done, particularly media responsibility as well, because although people will post photographs, uh, social media itself though is, is going to be an issue because we can't control that. But certainly the media, I think, has got a responsibility around those sorts of those shots. Mr. Shee's also added that whether it's the security forces or a security company, they should always try to refine their operational capabilities and their tactics. We all learn from each other around the world and it's best to take best practice from everywhere. We all learn from each other. No one's got every piece of information. We all learn and every single environment is different. So in fact when you arrive at a bank or an ATM, it could be a gas station, it could be a bank, it could be anywhere. So every scenario is different and of course they need to be reviewed to look at the best way in which they approach. Routine kills people as well. So they're changing up the times I'm sure. So there's no pattern to what they're doing. And that's the way to do it. But ultimately, prevention is the best cure. Prevention is using devices that render the money absolutely useless that they're trying to steal and will identify the perpetrators immediately. A Manchester woman is crying foul this afternoon. She says she was the victim of police abuse that has left her suffering medically and financially. O'Shane Masters reports. Jodian Mars says she was shot by the police on February 8. The incident allegedly happened while she and her fiancé were on their way from Alligator Pond to the parish. We saw two police along the roadway 
the vehicle definitely drive past both of the police. The police them didn't stop the vehicle or anything, so he continued to drive. We heard a loud explosion. I turned to him and I said, um, babes, I got shot. He said, really, the police really fire shot in the vehicle from back way and he didn't stop the vehicle or anything. I said to him, I'm going to jump through the window because I don't know what else to do. He said, keep calm. I'm going to drive faster. Until I see crowd, I will stop. Wish he continue to drive faster until he see crowd. He stop. She said the police took her to the hospital and since then, she has been left on her own. She wants justice and says she is waiting to speak with the leadership of the Manchester police about the conduct of the officers. You train to be a police. You claim to say you stop the vehicle and the vehicle don't stop. You run down the vehicle or you call for backup. Do not shoot another vehicle from back way. And I'm not getting any justice and I don't know what to do. I'm, my aunt is injured right now. I'm in pain and I'm not hearing anything. Neither from the police, the Indicom, nor nobody. What's wrong? Her piling medical bills, pain and trauma are reminders of the frightening ordeal. Compounding the issue, she said the officers in question are still on the job while she has not been able to earn. I even have medication to buy and I can't purchase it because I definitely run out of cash. I have to pay the private doctor money to remove the gunshot, then I have to pay another money to get an x-ray done. And I have a whole heap of things left to do. I'm a store employee and I'm not working. The Independent Commission of Investigations, Indicom, has been notified of the case and is conducting their investigations, but she is not entirely confident in them either. Monday I went at the Indicom and only thing I'm getting is prayer attitude. No one spoke to me good or anything. And I need to hear what's going on for me because I definitely can't take this no more. I just feel lonely. No one is there for me. Ashade Masters, TVJ News. Some business operators are again raising concerns about the closure of a section of the Belmont property in St. Anne, commonly known as Little Duns River. But the Urban Development Corporation, which owns the property, says the decision taken to restrict access remains in place. Since September last year, the police have closed Little Duns River following the murder of a young man near the beach. The police also warned that more murders could happen if the owners of the property did not take charge of it. The property, which is owned by the Urban Development Corporation, UDC, has been closed since. But this ongoing closure is not going down well with some business operators who used to depend on the area for a living. We don't exist. We try our best here. We keep up this place. This is where we eat with daily bread. We use them go to school, we family eat food, we pay our bill and all of those things what we do here. Keep it clean, make sure anybody come here, we take care of them. An incident happen and it's like them close down your place tell we them we walk me up back with I have a little shop down there where I sell some little craft item and me rent two chair and two locker box and them thing there. To secure the people them things when they come a beach, you know. And make sure the people are all right, you know. How affected are you right now? The fact that your locker box and your things um, close up right now, please. Well, I affect bad, bad because since the COVID, I don't get anything right through the COVID. They say they are getting a severe beating from the closure and subsequent lack of income as their bills continue to pile up. We want the place to open up back, you know, so we can make some money and we can live happy again because we use them up to school. We build them up, pile up, aren't we? Right now, tax office write me. I owe them how much money for the same business we do down here. I just run a tuck shop down here. I'm a licensed lifeguard. As I run here, I still put it out to the people and make sure them okay in the water. So we're working like volunteers, same way with the people in Jamaica. It's not just us alone benefit from this place, the whole Jamaica. For people, we come with them family, with them drink, same way and sell, and them family and enjoy this place. They're making this appeal. So I'm calling on the Prime Minister, please, if you can do something for us to try to open the place, because I hear them talking about everything else that happened around the island, and I don't hear anyone say anything about the opening of Little Duns River that benefits sentient people and the whole world. Meanwhile, the UDC says Little Duns River is not a licensed public beach, as it has none of the requisite permits and do not have basic sanitary conveniences and other amenities. The UDC also says 
it does not operate the property as a licensed public beach. The decision taken by the corporation to restrict access in support of public safety remains in place. It says it continues to encourage the public's cooperation. It's time for a break. Stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. The 72-hour strike notice served on bauxite and alumina company Windalco, a subsidiary of UC Rosal, has been called off. President of the Union of Clerical Administrative and Supervisory Employees, Vincent Morrison, says following a meeting on Monday, the workers and the company agreed to two days of negotiations to clear up outstanding issues. have two days set to continue the negotiations at the Ministry of Labour. Wednesday, starting at 10, and Thursday of this week, starting at 10 o'clock. We believe that those days are going to be very crucial. Uh, the company has agreed to change its mode of operandi, that is, to negotiate in a more open and transparent way. The Ministry has asked us, in the meantime, to put a hold on the strike notice that we served to have started on Monday to expire on Thursday morning, and we have agreed to put a hold on the strike notice. So those two dates, Wednesday and Thursday, are going to be very crucial. He says the cancelling of the strike notice is not an indication that the union or the workers have become less strident in their position, but signals a willingness to compromise as the company has also adjusted its stance. Last week, over 600 production workers employed to Windalco voted to take industrial action following a breakdown of wage negotiations between the management of the company and the union. Residents of Bottom Bonnet in St. Catherine are struggling to deal with a water crisis in their community. They say they have been without the precious commodity for decades. Long before this latest drought, residents of Bottom Bonnet have been without water in their taps. The community is located in deep rural St. Catherine, where farming is the mainstay. For you days, you know, for you days, well young, like, I say 10, 12. You know, so me live here from a small, and me left go town, and me come back. And me I tell you the truth, about 24 years now, we don't have no water running in the pipe. As such, they have been heavily relying on rainwater harvesting. But with less rainfall over the years, they are running out of options. Well, them used to harvest water from up one place named up a cave, we used to call up there, so cave. So them harvest the water and come down, but no, long time now, them not do it. We have one gully down there, so sometimes them put one tank there, then put the pump, and we pump water in the tank. Sometimes we have to drop money in the one pan to get water for the pump, like we can buy oil or anything, or if anything, do the pump or so. There is also a school in the area. But what the government has really implemented is that they have allowed NWC to truck water to us sometimes. So if we are short on water, the NWC will come in and they will fill us in. So when we were having the water shortage, like last week or the week before, when it wasn't raining, it was Councillor Dunn who gave us water through Parish Council. So that's how we really got our top up until the rains would have started last week. So now the people are appealing to the National Water Commission to intervene as their livelihood depends on it. We have springs, yes, because even the last time the MP was at meeting, had we seen our video with one of the, the springs and she should have gotten the NRCA or NWSA come to test the water to see the quality and the flow, but they haven't get to that as yet. President of the Citizens Association, Ranford MacDonald, says approximately 500 residents are living in the community. Where water is concerned, I tell you, they, they can do better because, they, as I said, all the rest of guys in the community get water. See, once a week, it's just somehow they have turned it on to come around this side. When contacted, Acting Corporate Public Relations Manager Delano Williams says the NWC is aware of the issue and is exploring several options to get water to the residents of Bottom Bonnet. It's now time for the Business Minute. 
Loans going to the private sector have increased. Chairman of the Economic Program Oversight Committee, EPOC, Keith Duncan, says more credit was extended to businesses by deposit-taking institutions up to November 2022 compared with the previous year. We're at 11.8% um, and that's higher at the end of November 2022 in terms of growth in loans advanced by deposit-taking institutions, which was higher than 7.9% was in, as at November 2021, and but lower than prior to COVID at 16.5%. So we're trending in the right directions. Further afield, Carnival Cruise Line reported bookings for future cruises during the first quarter of 2023 reached its highest volumes for any quarter in its history. The company on Monday said future bookings broke records for its North America and Australia segment as well as its Europe segment. Bookings for Europe now stand at over 80% of its 2019 levels before the pandemic. At the same time, this year's North America and Australia's booking curve mirrors 2019 at its peak. This despite higher ticket prices in 2023. Carnival says it expects the growth to continue. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Oshane Masters. Time now for the top regional and international stories. The Trinidad-based Caribbean Court of Justice has signed a memorandum of understanding with the CARICOM Secretariat aimed at improving access and delivery of justice in the Caribbean region. The agreement formalizes the partnership between the two regional institutions to execute several justice and legal sector projects funded by the European Union's 11th European Development Fund. On the international scene, at least 37 people died after fire broke out at a migration center in Mexico's northern border city of Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua State. The authorities said the fire at the Office of the National Migration Institute occurred after they picked up about 71 migrants from the streets of the city. The cause of the fire or the victims' nationalities have not been released by the authorities. And. Police in Nashville are digging into the background and motivations of a former student who entered the Christian elementary school armed with AR-style weapons and detailed maps and open fire, killing three children and three adults. Metro Police Chief John Drake said the shooter, identified as 28-year-old Audrey Hale, was shot and killed by police during Monday's attack, leaving behind drawn-out maps of the Covenant School detailing how this was all going to take place. Investigators were expected to spend Tuesday processing the scene and gathering more details on what had happened. And those were the top regional and international stories. I'm Raquel Porto. Thank you, Raquel. We head to a quick break. When we come back, we have your midday sports report with Giovanni Dennis.